Warriors, this by far might be the most important video I've done in my history to open up your eyes that it's all happening in plain sight. The beautiful thing about it was 7 billion people in the world, there's a small, small fraction of people woke up right now that understand what's happening, moving the new quantum financial system, fourth industrial revolution, the biggest shift in generational wealth. But the blinders are on, but it's happening in plain sight. And as you deny it, Christians are saying that this is the mark of the beast as they use Facebook, as they use YouTube, as they use Google, as they say this on TikTok and Instagram, and they're actually part of the machine. So as they look this way at a pandemic and they look this way, there's a whole nother narrative happening this way. And I'm going to start to connect the dots for you so you can open up your eyes and your awareness and you can see how we're becoming the uncommon 1%. Now, why am I sharing this with you guys? I'm already set. I pack my bags in the digital space. I've been investing in cryptocurrency for the last year. I've put my focus, my energy, and helping my warriors pack their bags and get ready for the shift to the quantum financial system. Warriors, we are moving to it. There's nothing you can do to stop it. And I'm going to connect some dots for you today. They're going to open up your eyes and your awareness. So if you want to know exactly what me and my warriors are doing, see my exact portfolio, mind, body, immunity, and I show my generational wealth building plan and how I manage the quantum financial system, click the link down below to join our free Facebook group or get right into the Warrior Academy. It's 90% off right now. All right, so let's go ahead and get it kicked off. Make sure you like, subscribe, comment. I'm Coach JV, the top health and mindset coach in the world. What you believe in your heart, you think in your mind, will eventually become your words and become your reality. Now we know that the tension spans of human being is five seconds. In the 1980s, it was about 30 minutes. And now I have five seconds to capture your attention. Now most of you are not going to make it all the way to the end of this video. So at the end of this video, I'm going to have a comment or a word that you can put down below to prove that you're a true warrior. I'm challenging you warriors to listen to these things because what's going to happen as you're trying to pay attention, boom, something's going to capture your attention. That's by design warriors. It's by design. It's called preemptive or predictive programming. It's keeping you focused over here on a narrative as the whole world's shifting over here. And I'll tell you what, there's going to be more billionaires and millionaires, new billionaires and millionaires created within the next year, specifically 2021. So let's break this down. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you on a journey for those who have been skeptics and those who keep saying that, um, you know, it's the mark of the beast. We're moving into this new. Now, if you if you think about this for just a moment, if you believe that cryptocurrency is the mark of the beast and you shouldn't be using a credit card. You shouldn't be using online banking. You shouldn't be using Facebook. You shouldn't be using Google. You shouldn't be watching this on YouTube and you sure as hell shouldn't be on TikTok because it's already happening, warriors. So as you deny this and you judge those talking about this, you're actually part of the problem. So if you truly believe that, then you should have shut off your social media. You should shut off Facebook. You should shut off YouTube. You should shut off the very thing where you're saying that on TikTok. And you should go live out in the forest by yourself with no technology because you're already part of the system, warriors. And so I'm going to connect the dots for you. And I'm going to show you how you can invest in the new quantum financial system and how you can be part of the biggest shift in generational wealth. We are already there, warriors. It's not happening. It's not coming. It's already here. The Great Reset happened started back in 2006, in my opinion. 2008, the crash the market on purpose. And now here we are switching to a new asset class since the 1600s. All right, so I'm going to break this down. So the first person I'm going to show you is Michael Saylor. He is the founder and CEO, president of MicroStrategies. Now, MicroStrategies, if you know, I'm going to connect the dots for you guys. In my opinion, remember, this is my opinion. I'm not a financial advice, not fi financial advisor, excuse me. None of this is financial advice. I'm sharing you what I see and how I connect the dots, and how I don't look at the narrative, and I listen to words. Now, you're going to see a big shift. Billionaires are throwing their money into Bitcoin right now. Why are they all moving over to Bitcoin as you're being told it's a fraud? So I'm going to break down this video from 2011 from Michael Saylor. We're going to look at Wikipedia and a couple of events that have happened since 2011. We're going to go uh, look at... Uh, now what he's doing, how Michael Saylor switched his tone a little bit and now is heavily going into Bitcoin. Then we're going to talk about how the Republican par uh, senator grills uh, Mark Zuckerberg on Facebook 
and how the very thing you're using Facebook is going to how you're trans how you're going to transact money. So you're already part of the system warriors. It's time to open up your eyes. So let's watch this video first. I'll narrate this as we go along. I want to thank all of you for being here today. Um, I think 2011 is a fascinating year. It's, I think it's the most interesting year in the history of micro strategy. It's, uh, it may very well be the most interesting year in the history of technology. There are extraordinary set of forces that are rippling through the economy right now. Uh, it's causing extraordinary amount of enthusiasm, but an incredible amount of, uh, of uh, anxiety as well. Um, what we're seeing is, is a set of technology forces that are impacting not just the software industry or the computer industry, but governments. So let's stop and look at this really quickly. Big data, mobile, social, cloud. This is 2011. Companies, industry, economy, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, big data tracking everything you do. Cloud systems storing everything. As you say, this is the mark of the beast. You're already in it. And then mobile. All of you guys are watching this on a phone, probably 85 to 90 percent of you. Uh, economies, entire industries. And um, uh, it's possible for these forces to, to topple a government. It's possible for them to topple a brand. We also see brands being created. Uh, phenomena like uh, Justin Bieber didn't exist without uh, networks like YouTube. Uh, we saw all the so key what he just said to topple governments and I'm going to take you through some steps since 2011 they're going to let you know that they're letting him know what he needs to do all the the turmoil that's taken place throughout the Middle East we've seen for the first time uh, countries pull the plug on the internet in order to slow down some of these forces we're seeing more and more in the media uh, interesting uh, stories on um, the political struggles between governments uh, and uh, networks and technology companies. Uh, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, you wouldn't have ever expected that um, an entire government would be threatened by a Silicon Valley startup. But now we actually see these sort of things. So it's a fascinating time to be in the industry. What I wanted to do today was to share with you our perspective on all the forces that are shaping the economy <clears throat> and also to um, to share with you some of the investments that we're making at MicroStrategy in order to, to make our customers successful and allow all of our customers and our partners to, uh, to benefit from all of these changes in the economy right now and, uh, and to get ahead of them instead of chasing them. I think we... Okay, we so I'm going to stop right there. I want you to listen to what he said. He brought up government disruption twice, okay? And I'm going to show you nine years later exactly where we're at. You're being sold a narrative. You're being preemptive programming, predictive programming. They're letting out slowly but surely. Look up MicroStrategy. Actually, let's do it together. So let's go over to Wikipedia. All you guys trust Wikipedia, right? So, um, so Michael J. Saylor, I uh, was born on February 4th, who cares? Uh, an American entrepreneur and business executive who co-founded and leads MicroStrategy. So let's break this down really quickly. So MicroStrategy, this is really important to understand. So MicroStrategy is a huge company. So they use the funds from DuPont. Sailor founded MicroStrategy with Sajin Bazing. can't even say his name. Uh, they were the company that helped McDonald's learn how to manipulate people into falling in love with McDonald's. Okay, they developed applications to analyze efficiency, efficiency of promotions. So his company is the company that brought McDonald's into your lap over and over and over and over and over and over again. Remember, preemptive programming, marketing. Remember, these guys are from MIT, smart, smart people. MIT is ran by the government, in my opinion. So SEC investigation in March, this is where I'm going to connect the dots. In March 2000, the U.S. Securities Exchange Commission brought charges against Sailor and two other MicroStrategy executives for the company's inaccurate reporting of financial results. For the preceding two years, in December 2000, Saylor settled with the SEC without admitting wrongdoing by paying 350,000 in penalties and personal discouragement of 8.3 million. As a result, the reinstatement of the results, the company's stock declined in value and Saylor's net worth by six billion dollars. So the SEC was letting them know, hey, listen, you're making changes out there. We're going to punk you. We're going to let you know that we're in your back pocket. Okay. Now, this is interesting. Listen to what I'm about to say. 
Now, during the C word, okay, during the C word, in March 16th, 2020, in a 3,000 word memo to all MicroStrategy employees on March 16th, 2020, entitled My Thoughts on the C Word 19, Sailor criticized countered measures that are being recommended against the disease, saying that it's a soul stealing, debilitating to embrace the notions of social distancing and economy hibernation. Saylor also refused to close MicroStrategy's offices unless he was legally required to do so. The full content of the meadow appeared on Reddit for only a few minutes and was reposted by the Washington Business Journal. And I believe this has actually been pulled off. Now, he made a quick, quick, quick change by July 2020. I bet you that the government reached out to him and said, you need to shut your mouth. You are going against the grain. And lo and behold, on MicroStrategy's quarterly earnings conference call in July 20, that was March, April, May, June, July, five months later, a huge, huge change. Saylor announces his intentions for MicroStrategy to explore purchasing Bitcoin, gold, and alternative assets instead of holding cash. The following month, MicroStrategy used $250 million of its cash stockpile to purchase 21,454 Bitcoin. In September, Saylor announced that MicroStrategy had purchased an additional 175 million worth of Bitcoin. Saylor told Coindesk, I want something that I could put 450 million into, into for 100 years. Signal, new asset class, total new fourth industrial revolution, quantum financial system. So he had a big change of heart really quickly. Now let's watch this video. Welcome back to Fast Money. Bitcoin taking off this week, topping 19,000 for the first time since late 2017. For more on what is behind the move, where it goes from here, let's bring in Michael Saylor, CEO of MicroStrategy. Michael, great to have you with us. Um, Thanks for having me. We, we had you on because you're the CEO of a software company who decided to invest your cash into Bitcoin. Uh, and I'm wondering how, how you came about that decision. Were you, were you thinking we've got a lot of cash because our business generates a lot of cash? So, you know, could it be treasuries or money market, straight up cash or Bitcoin? I mean, what was your thought process? Well, the story here is due to the rapid expansion of the monetary supply by the central banks, the cost of capital has tripled from 5% to 15% over the past year. And if we look out over the next four years, bond coupons and EPS growth rates are going to need to exceed that hurdle in order to preserve wealth. We had hundreds, 500 million worth of cash, but we knew we were going to generate an, another 500 million worth of cash. And we realized that if we held it in cash, it was going to debase by 10, 15 percent a year. And I didn't want to lose half of it. So what isn't so well understood is the BTC. Bitcoin is the best safe haven treasury reserve asset in the world right now. And it's engineered to be superior to gold in all aspects. So that, that being the case... A lot of people understand the assets. Doesn't it look like he's reading something? Isn't that interesting? Story of Bitcoin. It's up 100% annually each year for the past decade, more or less. Mm -hmm. What they don't understand is that Bitcoin's a, it's a monetary network. And as a monetary network, it's capable of storing and channeling energy over time without power loss. Uh -huh. So we got really excited about this idea. And we saw it as a solution for the store of value problem, not just for the $300 trillion of capital in the world, but for the 7.5 billion people right. on the planet. And so that that's pretty compelling. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Go sorry, ahead. sorry to interrupt, Michael, but, you know, cash on a balance sheet and, and wanting to preserve the power of that cash is one thing. Investing it in something that's speculative is another. I mean, are you are you a software company or are you a Bitcoin hedge fund? At this point, I mean, why bother with the software part of the business if your belief truly is, is that Bitcoin is going to go up 100 percent every year, uh, you know, going forward? Well, first of all, we do have a software company generating cash. But if we simply swept the cash into fiat currency and allowed it to base at 15 percent a year, we'd be losing as much on the balance sheet as we generated from the P&L. So that didn't make sense. Um, on the other hand, the traditional concerns about Bitcoin have been that it might be hacked, it might be copied, it might be banned. And after a decade, it hasn't been hacked. No one's managed to copy it. It's not going to be banned. 
the narrative, the narrative, it's all over the news now, Warriors, but you're watching the C word. It's all over the news. Brad Garlinghouse from XRP, one of my favorite investments. He is all over the news right now. You got billionaires like Michael Saylor. In March, he's talking about the COVID, breaking it down and saying that he's not going to participate. And now all of a sudden in July, he's moving all his assets into Bitcoin. Okay, so let's go a little bit further. I hope you're still hanging on. Now, let's break down where I'm heading with this. So Micro Saylor, Micro, Micro Strategies, right? This company is controlling the world. And now we're going into Facebook that literally, literally has more people under its control than in history. Now watch this. Listen to this interview. And then we're going to break down what Libra is. So Libra is involved with Facebook. Libra, Facebook is going to be the new monetary exchange. You are already operating on this. They've been setting you up for a long time. Listen to what they're saying right now. They have everything you're doing, your data, how you think, how you walk, where you shop, what you do, what you post, your face, everything. And everything will move across the Facebook rails. 19th century, the heads of the biggest corporations in America, the robber barons, got together and they set rates, they set prices, they determined how they would control information flow, they determined how they get rid of competition. And uh, I'll be darned if we aren't right back there again. And except for this time, you're the robber barons. Your companies are the most powerful companies in the world. And I want to talk about how you're coordinating together to control information. In recent days, my office was contacted by a Facebook whistleblower, a former employee of the company with direct knowledge of the company's content moderation practices. And I want to start by talking about an internal platform called Tasks that Facebook uses to coordinate projects, including censorship. The Tasks platform allows Facebook employees to communicate about projects they're working on together. That includes Facebook censorship teams, including the so-called community well-being team, the integrity team, and the hate speech engineering team, who all use the task platform to discuss which individuals or hashtags or websites to ban. Now, Mr. Zuckerberg, you're familiar with the task platform, aren't you? Uh, Senator, uh, we use the, the task system for, um, I, I think it's, as you say, for people coordinating all kinds of uh, work across the company, although I, I'm not sure if I'd agree with the characterization specifically um, around content moderation that you gave. Well, uh, let's get into that. So, and let me see if we can refresh your memory and, and provide folks at home watching with an example. Here over my shoulder is an example. It's a screenshot of the task platform in use. You'll notice if the cameras zoom in, several references to election integrity throughout on these lists of tasks. Again, this is shared across Facebook sites, uh, company locations, by working groups. What particularly intrigued me is that the platform reflects censorship input from Google and Twitter as well. So Facebook, as I understand it, Facebook censorship teams communicate with their counterparts at Twitter and Google and then enter those companies' suggestions – for censorship onto the task platform so that Facebook can then follow up with them and effectively coordinate their censorship efforts. Mr. Zuckerberg, let me just ask you directly under oath now, does Facebook coordinate its content moderation policies or efforts in any way with Google or Twitter? Senator, let me be clear about this. Uh, we, uh, we do coordinate on and, and share signals on security-related topics. Uh, so, for example, if there is um, signal around a terrorist attack or around child exploitation imagery or around a foreign government uh, creating an influence operation, that is an area where the companies um, do share signals about what they see. But I think it's important to be very clear that that is distinct from the content moderation policies uh, that we or the other companies have, where once we share intelligence or signals between the companies, uh, each company makes its own assessment of the right way to address uh, and deal with that information. Well, I, I'm talking about content moderation. I'm talking about individuals, websites, hashtags, phrases to ban. Is it your testimony that you do not communicate with Twitter or Google about content moderation about individuals, websites, phrases, hashtags to ban? Just yes or no. Do you communicate with Twitter or Google 
about coordinating your policies in this way? Senator, we do not coordinate our policies. Do your Facebook content moderation teams communicate with their counterparts at Twitter or Google? Uh, Senator, I'm not aware of anything specific, but I, I think it would be uh, probably pretty normal for people to talk to their, their peers and colleagues in the industry. It would but be normal, but you don't do it? No, I, I, I'm, I'm saying that I, I, I'm not aware of any particular conversation, but I would expect that some level of, of communication probably happens. Ah, but that well, is different from coordinating uh, what our policies are or our responses in specific instances. Well, fortunately, I understand that the task platform is searchable. So will you provide a list of every mention of Google or Twitter from the task platform to this committee? Senator, that's something that I can follow up with you and your team after on. Well, uh, yes or no, I'm, I'm sure you can follow up with the list, but why don't you commit while I've got you here under oath? It's so much better to do this under oath. Will you commit now to providing a list from the tasks platform of every mention of Google or Twitter? Senator, respectfully, I'm, I'm without having looked into this, I'm not aware of any sensitivity that might exist around that, so I don't think it would be uh, wise for me to commit to that right now, but so I would be happy to follow up. How many items on the task platform reflect that Facebook, Twitter, and Google are sharing information about websites or hashtags or platforms that they want to suppress? Uh, Senator, I, I, I do not know. Uh, will you provide a list of every website and hashtag that Facebook content moderation teams have discussed banning on the task platform? Senator, again, I would be happy to follow up with you or your team uh, to discuss further how we might move forward on that. But without will, just, will you commit to it here? You, Senator Cruz and Senator Lee both asked you for lists of individuals, websites, entities that have been subject to content moderation. You expressed doubt about whether any such information exists, but you've also now said that the task website, you've, you've, you've acknowledged the task platform exists, that it is searchable. So will you commit to providing the information you have logged on the task website about content moderation that your company has undertaken? Yes or no? Senator, I think it would be better to, to follow up once I've had a chance to discuss with my team what any wow. sensitivity around that would be that um, th that might prevent um, the, the kind of sharing that you're talking about. But once I've done that, I would be happy to, to follow up. All right. So you won't you won't commit to do it here. We could, of course, subpoena this information. But I'd much rather get it from you voluntarily. But I think let everybody take note that, that Mr. Zuckerberg has now repeatedly refused to provide information that he knows that he has and has now acknowledged that he has that tasks has under oath. Let me let me switch to a different topic. Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, tell me about Centra. What is the Facebook internal tool called Centra? Uh, Senator, I'm not aware of any tool with that name. Mm. Well, Matt, let me see if this refreshes your memory. There's a demonstrative now over my shoulder. Centra is a tool that Facebook uses to track its users, not just on Facebook, but across the entire Internet. Centra tracks different profiles that a user visits, their message recipients, their linked accounts, the pages they visit around the web that have Facebook buttons. Centra also uses behavioral data to monitor users' accounts, even if those accounts are registered under a different name. And you can see a shot here, a screenshot provided to us of the Centra platform. We blocked out the user's name in the interest of privacy, although you can see this individual's birth date and age when they first started using Facebook, their last login, as well as all manner of trackings. How many different devices have they used to access Facebook? How many different accounts are associated with their name? What accounts have they visited? What photos have they tagged? And on and on and on. Mr. Zuckerberg, how many accounts in the United States have been subject to review and shut down through Centra? Senator, I do not know because I'm not actually familiar with the name of that tool. I'm sure that we have tools that help us with uh, our, our platform and community integrity work. Um, but I, I am not familiar with that name. Do you have a tool that does exactly what I've described and that you can see here over my shoulder? Or are you saying that that doesn't exist? Senator, I, I'm saying that I'm not familiar with it and that I, I'd be happy to follow up uh, and, and uh, get you and your team the information that, that you would like on this. 
Um, but I, I'm, I'm limited in what I can, what, what I'm familiar with and can share today. It's always amazing to me, Mr. Chairman, how many people before this committee suddenly develop amnesia. Maybe it is something about the air in the room. Let me ask you this. When a Facebook employee accesses a user's private information, like their private messages or their personally identifiable data, is a record made of that, Mr. Zuckerberg? Sorry, Sorry, Senator, could you repeat that? Is a record made of any time a Facebook employee accesses a user's private information, personal identify, identifiable information, for example, messages? Is a record made any time a Facebook employee does that? Uh, Senator, I believe so. Does it trigger an audit? Uh, Senator, I think sometimes it, it may. Um, How many audits have been conducted? So I'm just going to leave it right there, Warriors. You can watch this video by looking up Mark Zuckerberg Congress. Okay, let's go a little bit further. So what is Libra? Libra Cryptocurrency Project changes its name to DM to distance itself from Facebook. Libra is going to be the new currency of our world. It is going to operate on Facebook. So they changed their name to DM, and I'm going to walk you through what Libra is. So Libra is trying to be stopped by Congress, or is it a narrative, right? Is all this a political theater getting you ready for the new quantum financial system that's already underway? So we're going to play one more video, and then I'm going to send you on your way. Remember when these were fast? And these? Technology has improved the world around us. So why is it simple to send one of these anywhere in an instant, but not money? What if we made money truly global, stable, and secure? What if everyone was invited to the global economy with access to the same financial opportunities? Introducing Libra, a new global payment system designed for the digital world, backed by the belief that money should be fast for Ope in Lagos, simple for Saul's family business in Manila, and secure for Betsabe when sending money home to Mexico City. It's powered by blockchain, making it safe and accessible. No matter who you are, or where you're from. So join us as we move towards a world where money works for everyone. This is Libra, and it's just the beginning. So we'll start right there. Yes, it's just the beginning. So I want to take you on that journey again. Michael Saylor, MicroStrategies, started with McDonald's tracking everything to understand how to market to you, to sell to you. We went from MySpace to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. You're already part of it, Warriors. You're already part of the ecosystem. Now what you're missing is the biggest shift in generational wealth. You could be investing in the ecosystem. There's 7 billion people in the world, and I'll give you an example. In XRP, what I believe is going to be the new bridge currency for central banks, there's only 2 million people invested in XRP. 2 million people out of 7 billion people. It's because, as a shift, they want you looking this way. Because they don't want you to know. They don't want you to become the uncommon 1%. So, Warriors, it's time for you to activate. It's time for you to protect your family. It's time for you to become the uncommon 1% and bring the money back to the people. Every single person in this world will be banked. And they did it through social media. They got us all addicted to social media, and that's how they're going to bring all the unbanked together and be able to track everything. You're already in it, Warriors. So those of you who are pushing back and saying it's the mark of the beast, then you need to get off all social media platforms because you're already part of the quantum financial system. If you want to learn how I'm training my Warriors and I'm showing them exactly what I'm doing in the quantum financial system, we work out live daily, nutrition, I show my exact portfolio. I'm not a financial advisor. It's not financial advice. I'm just documenting my journey into new quantum financial system. How I pack my bags and we're ready for generational wealth. You click the link down below. You can join today for 90% off. Don't miss this opportunity to protect your family. Warriors, rise. Let's go.